to the official podcast of FCS Fans Nation with your hosts, Kyler Neal, Matthew Frazee, and Lawrence Smith. FCS Fans Nation. I don't know what anybody tells you at work or at home, but if you go to Idaho or North Dakota, they're a lot cooler than you think. And they are the coolest places on the planet for one reason, because the folks from there never miss the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the FCS Fans Nation podcast, the unbiased buys and admin Matthew Frazee joined tonight with my main man, Chris Hammond, Mr. Tubbs at the club. Unfortunately, it's just us two tonight due to some uncircum- different circumstances for other folks, but we are ready to kick it. We're ready to have a good time. I think you guys are going to enjoy some perspectives from the questions we received from FCS Fans Nation. Chris, how are you doing this evening? Just you and me holding down the fort, bud. Man, I was telling you we're a little late recording this because I, I was actually stuck at you know like my day job. Uh, doing a little networking after work and I'm sitting there like watching my watch. I'm like, oh man, I got like 30 minutes. I got, I'm not going to make it. I'm like texting Matt. I'm like, I'm on my way. And he was like, you know, don't, if it's okay, we don't have to do it. Like, I don't want this to feel like a chore. I'm like, no, like I need this to get rid of everything else. Like let's talk FCS football. Like we've been waiting 400 days for it. It's here. Like you, I can't wait. You it's the hardest guy working. Kickoff. Chris, are you the hardest working person in FCS podcast? What do you have? Six podcasts this week? Yeah, I would say this week for sure. Um, that being said, I'm sure Sam Herter has been on like six podcasts, 12 radio shows and written five articles. So, you know, I do what I can. I might be the public, uh, publicly the most hardworking person this week. But, uh, you know, yeah, I'm just excited. That's I, I just want to get the excitement flowing throughout the FCS you know, core that, that we have here on FCS fans nation. And I was going to say, you said, unfortunately, I was going to say some people might be, but fortunately it's just you and I, I mean, me personally, I'm missing D log dude dog, but you know, I already talked to Kyler this week. We're fine without him. It's not like his team doesn't have a big game or anything. He's probably trying to shy away from comment, making comments on publicly. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> We're going to get to that big game that you just referenced here towards the end of the episode. I'm sure you may have some opinions on it. Uh, but we have many opinions and questions from our FCS Fans Nation page, where this entire broadcast is based around. Uh, if you guys don't know, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're just stumbling across this, searching on YouTube or Apple for FCS content, we have a social media group. That's where all these questions come from. Our members drive this content. So let's get right into it, Chris. We had a crazy week one action, I should say, since it was week week one, right? We already had week zero technically in the spring. Uh- I've seen it labeled as week two and this is week three, but I'm with you. I think when there's only one game on, that's a week zero. Last week was week one. Now we're week two. 100%. That's how I view it. I'm with you on there, man. Let's kick it right off with Peter Mooney, one of our best fans out there. James Madison guy. Met him in Frisco last year, and he wants to kick it off with some of the big home run hitters that are commonly talked about with FCS football. He wants to know. A question for the above average fans, calling you out, Chris, since you are the average fan, according to our followers. Um, How did NDSU, SDSU, and JMU look through one whole game? So we're looking at kind of those three big heavy hitters, some of those common top five teams. And I can just kick it off with it right now. I'm We're going to get into NDSU in a lot of depth, so I'll just kind of speak on baseline level about them right now. NDSU looked, in my opinion, phenomenal outstanding in every area except the concern we're going to talk about which people have identified the passing game lacked its explosiveness that it did in previous seasons which is a shocker it's almost like not every quarterback in ndsu moving forward will be a top 15 draft pick Uh, but ndsu in my opinion looked like a team with a great offensive line the defense looks young and ferocious the coaching calls were really good uh, it looked like a normal NDSU 2011 to 2013 type of win, grind it out, control the ground game, but maybe some lacking in the passing game. Um, I'll let you take, did you watch, get a chance for that UNI SDSU game, Chris? I did. I did. And I just want to say, I agree with you on NDSU. And if anything, we should roll back last week's clip when I said, I don't think Zeb Nolan's a bad quarterback, but I don't think he's Trey Lance. I nailed it. 
like that you're right but sdsu i mean i think that game that game is tough right like you look at it and yeah it took them to get down um till the final 10 seconds or whatever it was to score a touchdown uh, on the goal line to come out of that game and you're like wow you know they kind of struggled but that's because sda sdsu has built up this brand of being basically the number two team in the country and most people are forgetting depending on what poll you're looking at they were an underdog on the road in that game so it is a huge win and it, it might not be as blowouty as people wanted in the beginning but they had by far the toughest opponent week one they were on the road and they handled their business at the end of the day sdsu other than probably north dakota state just got through their toughest game of the year and you have to commend them for that um just to touch on jmu really quick I, it's just too soon to know like it's more head state like i'm not gonna say they didn't cover the spread and so therefore it was bad when they scored over 50 points right like <laughs> We, we just don't know. It's going to take until they get really into the CAA play and probably more realistically the playoffs to really know anything about James Madison this season. I think you're spot on that. In terms of you kind of have one fan base in South Dakota State who was really excited afterwards, obviously because of the win, but let's talk specifically quarterback play. They were like, whoa, true freshman, quarterback, baller, three touchdowns, game-winning drive, pass to Pierre Strong. So South Dakota State fans on Twitter, especially Facebook, they were really pumped with that win. Everybody was glad they won. There was obviously the reactions to it. I think you saw a few JMU fans saying, we need to see more from Cole Johnson. NDSU fans going, ooh, we need to see more from Zeb Nolan. And I think South Dakota State fans were more excited based around quarterback play. The rest of the roster for all those teams looked, looked pretty phenomenal. So yeah. those would be Either way, they're all favorites. They're all three going to make the playoffs. That's what we learned. They all three are what we thought they were. Give or take maybe a game like one of them will probably lose. Well, obviously, North Coast State or South Coast State because they play each other, but um, they're all going to be your heavy hitters in the playoffs this year. 100%. Uh, let's get moving into some categories, Chris. We actually had most of our questions condensed into kind of five or six core areas. So I kind of brought them all together. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, you're about to see our members questions posted on the screen. So not only are they going to get the personal shout out, but they're going to get screen time as well. And we are going to start with Tarleton State, my man, the Texans coming in with probably the biggest win of the week. I know UNISJC was big, but like the biggest like, whoa, FBS, we did it. Um, so let's start with Tarleton right away, throwing the questions out together, man. Dustin Helton says, let's just talk about Tarleton getting this big win right off the bat. Uh, Mr. Brandon Owens wants to know, is Tarleton State for real? And of course, Mr. Matt Contendo, apologize if I butchered the last name, is Carlton going to run the whack? So let's just start right now, man. What do you think about Tarleton State with that win? Let's talk about that domination. I mean, that was not just walking into New Mexico State and, whoa, 10-point victory. That was an absolute ass kicking. I could not believe what I was seeing. Um, I figured they had a chance for the upset because New Mexico State's not a great program, not a great team. Uh, four bowl appearances in their entire history of their program. And but it's an old I, program. <laughs> yeah, it's been around a while. I just didn't expect that sort of a blowout. They looked more athletic. They looked faster. The receivers looked bigger. It was awesome. So I would say they are for real, especially in the spring season where maybe some of those other big heavy hitters like Montana's and others are gone. I mean, they can fit in fine in that top 25 if they keep winning games. Uh, what was your takeaway? And I kind of want to go to you as for the, the whack talk. You're kind of more involved as the big sky and whack has been ramping up. What are yeah. your opinions on them when they transition forward and what do you think of the game? So uh, obviously I was the one I, I – other people did too, but I was on board on, you can see for those on YouTube, our backdrop is Tarleton state this week. Um, they deserved it. Now I'm going to be the first one to say, you just got to pump the brakes on this. I, this game, you cannot take anything away from you. Gotta remember New Mexico state is an FBS team playing in the spring. This is basically for them being used as a glorified spring game. Now to be said, it's not that just their twos and threes were playing. They definitely had starters out there, but I think anybody that actually watched the game, it was absolutely obvious. The, intensity level the new mexico state players were playing with compared to the tarleton state players new mexico viewed this as basically a glorified practice and then if you watched it you also noticed they were playing in el paso because the new mexico schools cannot play in new mexico so not only are they not really at home they're 44 miles away from home in the rival stadium playing in the spring after they just played a couple games in the fall um, that being said tarleton state was down five starters or five key players and still did it so they absolutely deserve respect and i'm not saying they're bad 
because at the end of the day, they went to overtime against McNeese the week before. So they're absolutely a good program, but everybody that's saying like, you know, this is, they're going to run, they just run, ran rough shot over an FBS program and they're going to run the whack and win the whole conference and win the whole league. Let's just pump the brakes. Dixie State plays New Mexico State this week. I expect it to be closer because New Mexico State seeing the headlines this week. But I also think Dixie State has a chance to beat them because New Mexico State is not taking these games serious at all. For them, it is it is a practice. That being said, I have seen enough from Tarleton State that we covered it on, on our Tubs of the Club podcast, You know, having history in the whack as Idaho. Tarleton and Dixie, the two additions, absolutely are ambitious programs. And Tarleton is showing out of the gate right now. And I can't wait for people to see Dixie State as well that they absolutely look like a team to be reckoned with. Uh, Abilene Christian, a younger team too, that has a lot of, uh, of you know gusto behind them. Sam Houston, the WAC is going to be a really good conference. That's what sucks is it's always going to be competitive, but Tarleton State has basically cemented themselves that they are not going to be a cakewalk for anybody in that conference. Take the New Mexico State game out of it. They took McNeese, who most people consider a top 25 team this year, to overtime. Tarleton is for real. But, like, let's pump the brakes on, like, they beat New Mexico State by a lot, and this is this huge deal. New Mexico State wasn't even playing in that game. But Tarleton is for real. So opposites, but same point, I guess. Yeah, we'll kind of see how it plays out the rest of the way. They kind of feel like UNA when they came in, Northern Alabama, kind of a storied program coming down from the Division II level or going up, I should say. Uh, they went up to NDSU right away. Obviously, NDSU won by a lot of points, but it wasn't like, 70 to whatever it was like 38 to 7 or something and people are like oh wow that was respectful and then i think they got an upset win within the fcs top 25 going forward with another valley team um i'm i'm probably incorrect in this but i just remember them coming in hot and then kind of leveling out a little bit i would yeah. see the same trajectory for tarleton state but credit to them they should be really excited for their fans uh i just want to hop on a quick comment before we move on i don't think anybody's going to just like overtake sam houston with, with that whack like sam houston people forget how good they actually are that is a talented program they will be in my opinion and i think most the standard for that conference and you are going to try to match that or be on par with them year after year so yep 100 percent. good stuff all right let's roll into there are five different questions for what is to no surprise uh my squad but i remained unbiased towards them for the NDSU Bison. And there is a plethora of questions we have for these guys. I have to pull up the good old phone just so I don't get them all wrong. Um, but let's kind of start with one of the big questions. Uh, Brandon Anderson wants to know that Zeb, Dol Zeb Nolan didn't absolutely light it up. And Young's against Youngstown's defense, he says, how screwed are the Bison this year? Take it as serious as you want. Uh, Dan Lennon wants to know the defense run game was stout and impressive, but is the passing game going to be the weak link of NDSU 2021? Uh, Jamie Williams wants to mostly know for myself, does Zeb Nolan not being a runner impact the Bison offense in comparison to Lance and Stick and Wentz? Uh, there's two other questions here we'll get to about the Bison, but those three starting off. Let me just kind of go on kind of my thoughts of what I've thought about it. There are mm -hmm. two equal perspectives from what I've heard from Bison fans and what I keep mentally going back and forth with. There's the we've been spoiled NDSU mentality, and then there's maybe the pump the brakes reality NDSU mentality. And the spoiled NDSU mentality is number two overall draft pick, fifth round draft pick, going to be top 15 draft pick, quarterback, instant, awesome, great passers, great running ability. So Zeb steps in and suddenly we see a guy who struggles in his first game, isn't making it to his second reads through kind of a not great duck deep pass to Christian Watson, pass interference on that play. And immediately it's freak out time. Um, never you know mind you that ndsu back in 2011 won games like this all the time ground on the have a game manager quarterback in brock jensen rely on the ground game stout defense win a national title uh never mind you that in 2015 you lose to montana in week one you lose to usd five weeks later uh, carson wentz goes out with a season and an injury and you still win a national title so now suddenly, just because Zeb Nolan on his first game and however many years where he's actually the official starter kind of struggles, you win 25 to seven, Bison Nation gets really nervous. Here is the thing that's more important than just throwing out random situations. Just like Jamie Williams said, this is the interesting fact. If you know anything about Bison football, even with Brock Jensen, when the offense is stalling and things are breaking down, it doesn't seem to be going forward. It seemed like that quarterback designed run, or at least the quarterback making something happen with his legs, 
kept that offense going, kept kept that dual threat. So now if Zeb Nolan is unable to be used in that running game and the passing game's not getting to that second read and it's not processing quickly, this is unfair. We'll see what he looks like in six, seven weeks. But if that continues, suddenly James Madison and these teams who are just kind of these elite defenses, they are going to simply say, eight in the box, stop those running backs, push the offensive line back, and Zeb beat us one-on-one. That's it. Similar to what 2016 uh, JMU did. They just hounded NDSU, made Easton Stick beat him with their with his arm. He wasn't as good of a passer at that time to be able to beat them. And, you know, it just didn't happen. So my takeaway is, yes, if you are not a Bison fan, you should be a little bit excited to think that Zeb Nolan's athletic ability being lower than those three previous quarterbacks is going to give you an advantage moving forward. But I caution you as well to say, if you don't think NDSU can somehow figure it out or Zeb figures it out at some point, we've seen what they've done the last decade. So, Chris, yeah. uh, I have two more buys and questions, but what do you kind of think? What are your takeaway from um, Zeb Nolan's performance mostly and kind of discounting the rest of it? Because NDSU's defense did look elite. The coaching was good. Everything else looked great. There's one thing people are concerned about. What do you think? Yeah, well, and like I said, I said it last week. Zeb Nolan is a good quarterback. I just think... He's a step down from what NDSU is used to. At some point, they're going to have to run into SDSU, or uh, and we'll see how they look against somebody other than Northern Iowa as well. But Weber or James, there's going to be that those two teams that are really good to get paired up in the semis, and there's going to be that one team and then a team that kind of just snuck in there. Most likely, the Bison are going back to the championship, whether it's Zeb Nolan or not, is whether they win it, and. I still think Zeb Nolan is good enough to win it. People forget they don't get a lot of uh, of faith. Youngstown State was in the national title game less than five years ago. Like this team is still a decent team in the Missouri Valley, and they always play. From what I've seen, Missouri Valley teams pretty dang difficult. And a lot of people thought that their biggest problem was Bo Pelini at coach. Bo Pelini is gone now. Youngstown had a terrible offense but they have they had a great defense and i think holding zeb nolan to this like he was supposed to light it up for 500 yards and four touchdowns or whatever against one of the stronger defenses is just not fair um i think ndsu is going to be fine you know yeah maybe it gives a little bit of hope to the rest of these fan base so hopefully it keeps a little interest going into the season so it, it's good for the fcs in general that people think there might be a chink in the armor but at the end of the day zeb nolan could easily easily take the bison to another national title. Uh, but like I said last week, I think Quincy Patterson takes it over in the fall. It, it's just, I think he's more, he's more what NDSU likes, but Zeb Nolan is, NDSU is going to be fine. That's my grand takeaway. They played a tough defensive team. They had Trey Lance up to what October. So it's not like Zeb Nolan's been taking a ton of the ones. Um, he hasn't had a whole off season. He basically had to play a, a showcase game where they had Trey Lance, who's going to be probably a top five, guaranteed a top 10 pick, probably a top five pick in the NFL draft. So obviously NDSU was giving him all the looks, making sure he would look good on TV. Zeb Nolan just hasn't had the practice and the reps that you'd want. You can't take anything away from a week one game. They won, and they won pretty nicely. That's the important thing. There you go. And Garth Raschenberger, um, was he going to ask that? Does Quincy Patterson get the starting QB over Zeb Nolan for NDSU this fall? You have predicted now and in the past that you do believe that does happen. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. If they win the national title and go undefeated, it's going to be hard to pull that away from them. We'll also see what Zeb turns into. Uh, don't forget in the playoffs in 2012, NDSU wins 14-7 to over Wofford. Uh, yeah. Don't forget that last year you beat Illinois State 9-3. to uh, you barely beat Southern Illinois, Missouri State. You only put up 22 points and they were terrible last year. You've had bad passing performances by Lance. He just had that running ability. That's where Jamie's question gets really unique where yeah. it's like, and, hey, don't forget, we've had bad passers, but they could run. So, yeah. And, and Zeb Nolan, honestly, like we said, will Quincy Patterson be starting over Zeb Nolan? If Zeb Nolan takes these guys on a national title run, there's a good chance he starts getting draft stock and doesn't have to return in the fall. So Quincy Patterson's not even winning the job over him is something that people are forgetting with playing this spring season. Like, let's not forget that. They might not be on the same team together next year. If he goes undefeated, NDSU again, I find it hard to believe that some NFL team won't take like a sixth or seventh round chance on him. I, I just do. Depends. We'll see. I mean, he can't have atrocious numbers, but I don't think he's going to put up atrocious numbers either. So. 
for sure. If I, to keep in mind. If by the end he ends up um, in Ben DiNucci range, Ben DiNucci, seventh round Dallas Cowboys. So exactly, you know, exactly. Nothing's impossible for sure. And last little question here on the Bison. Seth Meyer wants to know if Seth Wilson can't go, which he can't. Seth Wilson, who is slated on the depth chart as one and or a top back for NDSU. A knee injury. We hope he gets healthy soon. Um, do you think Kobe Johnson and Jalen can handle the workload as features backs? And who is going to be your change of pace back? You know, change of pace is, is yet to be seen. We've got a true freshman coming in who's going to be uh, contributing this upcoming week. I think Kobe Johnson is a game changer. But NDSU, we haven't had to rely on just one solid back, really, uh, until you go back to 2014 uh, with Johnny Crockett just running all over the place. So I would say uh, with Seth Wilson, I really hope he gets healthy. I really hope that he's okay, and I hope that he progresses and can play another year. But Seth Wilson at the same coin, he has been injured every year he's been with NDSU. He was a highly touted recruit, but he's never made it through a full season. So it's not like NDSU has relied on him for victories in the past. So we'll see what that looks like going forward. I do think Kobe Johnson is an all-star. I love that he wears number 24. His name is Kobe. And when he scores, I can yell, Kobe. So I love that. There's nothing better. So NDSU guys, we'll see how Zeb Nolan progresses. If he can, if he continues to struggle, which I doubt happens, um, there's going to be an opening because that's going to be tough to win a national title if you're not going to have a productive uh, passing game. Yeah, so. it's week one. Don't overreact. Yep, <laughs> well, that was uh, Sam Herder's Sam Herder's tweet. But he hates my team, as you can see on my T-shirt. I mean, on it's YouTube. everybody's team. God. He hates them all, man. God. Every single one is crazy. He covers the FCS and he hates all the teams. He's so mean. <laughs> um, let's move into the hated rivals of NDSU, South Dakota State. And I hope you guys don't think this is just some big three we want to talk about. What we want podcast. The page drives the narrative, and a lot of them want to know about the heavy hitters this week. So, if you don't um, like it, ask a question that doesn't involve them. We'll we'll do it. We'll do it. We these are we hit every question. Uh, South Dakota State, my man, big win for them over you and I. Seth Meyer, another question back to us. Does South Dakota State have any running backs to complement Pierre Strong Jr.? I was surprised he got all but one running back carry against you and I. Hey, uh, Pierre Strong Jr., I honestly can't speak so solely on the depth of them. I'm going to need Brendan and some of those SDSU fans on Twitter to maybe join us to describe their team a little bit to me. Uh, but I can say this, dude, Pierre Strong Jr. is a dog. That He is such a beast. I don't know why you would take him out if he's starting to get into a rhythm. That's my personal opinion. I saw yeah. him in the, se in the semifinal game where NDSU did beat them, but he was just cutting through. He's so big. He's so fast. Um, reminds me kind of a David Johnson type in you and I when he was dragging buys and defenders down the field. So I'm not sure if they've got really a good change of pace back, but I don't know if they need him. You can ride him like a bell cow the way you did Terrence West with Towson in 2013. So, yeah. it, um, and you can use him in the passing game as we saw as he catches the game winning touchdown. Absolute yeah. freakish. It, it's never bad to have a workhorse back. I don't know why, but just because the NFL's moved to this two back system, why it's such a bad thing now to have. Like you, you think about your Hall of Fame running backs, right? They weren't splitting carries. Emmett Smith, uh, Marsh, Marshall Falk, all these dudes. Hopefully, Marshawn Lynch. Like these guys, you can have a workhorse back. Like there's nothing wrong with having a workhorse back. I get the strategy of changing pace, uh, but as we mentioned, Pierre Strong. Usually, that's because those dudes have rocks for hands. He got the game-winning touchdown pass. The guy is just as lethal in the passing game. You look at South Dakota State's roster depth: freshman, sophomore, freshman. Those guys are probably going to be very limited contributors. Then they have a grad transfer, Jordan Meekum from Sacred Heart. So if there was a guy to bring in, it's probably going to be the 5'8", 190 pound. There's your change of pace back. Once again, when you have Pierre Strong, for Christ's sakes, his last name's Strong, man. Let him <laughs> run. <laughs> this is why the average fan is better because I claim to be unbiased and I can't name more than one South Dakota State running back. And the average fan who people love Mr. Chris Hammond's just dropping depth knowledge. Absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. What a beast. On his sixth podcast of the week, you that is a well-deserved beer he just sipped. So, um, Hey, man, how big of a win was that for South Dakota State? Uh, Adam Peterson wants to know. And he's also curious, how much will this loss impact you and I down the road in a much shorter season? So uh, I'll just speak on you and I. and then I, I'd like, love to get your thoughts on what you thought about SDSU. Uh, you and I, no room for error. I mean, you lose to NDSU and SDSU, and you have to be questioned where the quality win comes in then. Uh, maybe UND is good enough to where, no, they don't play, UND and you and I don't play it this in the yeah. spring season. So there you go. Uh, are you going to put you and I over other, over other teams because they had close losses to NDSU and SDSU? 
I don't think that's the case if there's six auto bids. So I personally think like you and I, it's do or die. NDSU in the final week of the season, that is a playoff game. So talk about a matchup. Uh, and they cannot trip up anywhere else the rest of the way of the spring. Just my opinion. Maybe you do you feel like two a uh, two loss team like that in the valley gets in if they have nothing special on their resume? If South Dakota State's an NDSU, their only losses are to one another. Like maybe if they lose to those two, right? Because um, the Missouri Valley is probably the strongest conference playing with basically everybody this year. And most would argue Indiana State being out actually helps to strengthen the schedule. Um, <laughs> but you and I, like you're looking, they're at Youngstown this week. And then they got Illinois State next week and Southern Illinois. So Youngstown, right? We just said they played better than some people thought against NDSU. So there's a chance people still have this opinion of Youngstown State not being very good. And so that could negatively affect them if they don't just blow them out, if it's close. Even though Youngstown looked like they could be a one of those teams that's a, a playoff ruiner. Not a, not, not going to get there, but can ruin people's playoffs. So it's, um, you have Illinois State, which is kind of a lot of question marks around them, how they can look without James Robinson on the team. And then you have Southern Illinois, who just got upset last week. So you, they kind of have this rough shot of really kind of potential frisky teams in the first four weeks. And if they slip up one more time, they're definitely done. Unless... I don't even know if they slip up against Youngstown, Illinois State, or Southern Illinois. I don't know if a surprise win at the end of the year against NDSU even gets them in. Probably, but I mean, I don't know. And and, and then after that, it's Missouri State, Western Illinois, South Dakota, like cakewalks. So they're going to be riding in on a really soft schedule, and then they have to be challenged out of the gate. So there, there is no room for error. They can only really accept to probably lose to NDSU. And then if they do lose to one of these next three, they have to beat NDSU and probably by more than just like a miracle one point pull it out the last minute victory. It probably has to be a touchdown or more to be like, no, we are good enough with two losses to put us in. Right. Absolutely. And it's man, you made a good point that that slip up. If it happens before NDSU is going to be detrimental and would an NDSU win even save you at that point, that's going to be super unique. Those last two weeks, SDSU, NDSU, and then NDSU at UNI are going to be massive for seeding playoffs, who's in, who's out, how it affects other teams who have one loss, zero losses on bad schedules. It's going to be huge. So, and then just back to South Dakota state, I think they had the best weekend. Um, I mean, Tarleton State, congratulations to him. I think you're like, wow, true freshman quarterback at UNI, a tough place to play, three touchdowns. SDSU should be pumped right now. Fans should be pumped. They should see uh, how Zeb performed and go, ooh, that didn't look that great. They should look at James Madison and be like, they graduated a lot of people. Of course, they look good against Morehead State. But what did Cole Johnson do? Um, he's a fifth-year FCS backup guy who's now getting a chance to start, but he handed the ball off all game. There's more to be seen, obviously. It's like you can't... Just like you said, Chris, it's week one, settle down. But between those three, to go back to that original Peter Mooney question, if I'm South Dakota State fan right now, I feel the best. I feel like I yeah. got a really good roster and I got a shot at this thing. You just you just beat uh, what the game was advertising as the number three team in the country, right? So it's like, yeah, you should feel good. You have yeah. one team now that's going to be ranked higher than you the rest of the year. Like they they proved what they need to prove. SDSU right now looks like a team that's booked their ticket to Frisco. So if you're SDSU, you're ecstatic as all get out. 100%. And let's move on to, oh my goodness, the Dakotas never end. I, I swear I'm not doing this on purpose. The page wants to know. And we will start with one of the most loyal UND fans we have on our page. He's been here for years. So credit to you, Matthew Ol Olson. Thank you for sticking by us. He wants to know, is UND a top 10 team? Or is this a cause of an inexperienced quarterback coming in when their starter got hurt? Obviously, Southern Illinois losing their stud guy. Uh, he believes they are a top team as their O-line dominated the second half. Uh, yeah, you know, Matthew, honestly, the game was pretty close, but UND kind of reminded me of, well, why wouldn't you do this? Build your team like NDSU. I mean, the offense and defense alliance took over the game late. They, they were running the ball really well, and that opened up the passing game. It allowed their quarterback on play action to make some magical throws and turnovers, defense. So UND played really well. The question is, though, I got to ask you, Matthew, is, do you believe or do people believe that UND is a top 10 team worthy of competing to go into the quarter semis? Or is UND this year Southern Illinois in the Missouri Valley? Are they the team that is going to look really good, get all the wins against everybody in the middle and at the bottom, but will not beat NDSU and not beat SDSU? They don't play UNI, but that was Southern Illinois last year. 
They did not have any quality win at a 7-6 and six record, and people thought they could be better than some playoff auto bids. They didn't get in because there's no quality win. I, I, As unbiased as possible, I think UND is going to be that team. I think they are going to lose to SDSU and NDSU, and I think they, ha- they could have a shot to beat everybody else because they're up and coming. Um, I could go two years of podcast back where I picked UND to be the next dynasty. I listed so many factors like coming back here, recruiting, yada, yada, yada. But I have to tell you, I think they are this year's Southern Illinois, and I don't know if that gets you in the playoffs if you don't have those two wins. Because Southern Illinois will not be an impressive win by the end of the year if they continue to drop down. Lots un- to unfold, but I don't think they're going to be a top 10 week. They can prove me wrong by defeating the Jackrabbits at home this weekend. And then Matthew Olson, I will come on here and I will start the show telling you that I was wrong. I'll tag you in the tweet on Twitter, my man. Chris, what do you think about UND? Do you think they got a shot? I was going to say, we're going to learn real stinking fast. Like real quick. 72 hours fast, whether they are legit or not. And, you know, it could just come down. If they can hang close against SDSU, it might be enough. Pending at the end of the year, they'll have NDSU, Youngstown, Missouri State, Illinois State. Three of those four teams we've covered might be frisky. The problem is, is North Dakota just one of those teams that falls into the frisky category or a contender category? We'll see this week against SDSU. If they beat SDSU after upsetting Southern Illinois last week, I would bet, I already got one condo on the line this week. I'll bet my vacation condo that we (laughs) probably have North Dakota's Alaris Dome the background next week because that would be the most impressive if two weeks in the FCS so far. So uh, we'll see. It was Southern Illinois. Some people had question marks about them coming into this year. Matthew Frazee notedly uh, last week, today, and last year. Like, uh, we'll see. Southern Illinois is a different beast, but they definitely, it's not like they snuck by them. They won by 23 points uh, at home, and they have SDSU at home too. So we'll see. It, it just sucks for the Jackrabbits kind of that, yeah, they've, you know, they might be walking into a buzzsaw, but 100%. I, I still like the Jacks in this matchup. And how did, how is that going to look not to ignore UND? But I don't want to get down this rabbit hole. Uh, but I, I do have to say, if SDSU gets this another win and NDSU goes and beats Southern Illinois, I mean, still, you have to look at SDSU and be like, okay, all right. Like, maybe you're not the little brother this spring, not to make this about SDSU and UND's category. But Brandon Owens also had a similar question with Missouri Valley, newcomer UND playing their first game in the conference. Is UND that good this year or is it overranked SIU? Not what we expected them to be. I think personally that we just saw two teams who were going to be that right below SDSU, NDSU level for this year battling out and UND is clearly better. Uh, The quarterback injury did not help. That game was closer up until that point, but then turnovers started happening. It got chaotic. So I will say that they are not going to be some, I'm I don't, not going to predict them as a playoff team at this point. And I will eat that crow next week if SDSU goes in and gets beat by UND. So yep. it, uh, it was a mix. That's my answer. It was a mix. We'll yeah. see. Was it, was it more Southern Illinois being overrated or was it more NDSU being good? It really depends what happens at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday. We will find out real soon what North Dakota is, if they're frisky or a contender. I can't wait. And they played well, so kudos to you, UND. You you proved the FCS world wrong in terms of, hey, don't doubt us. So good stuff. Big Sky team, let's go. (laughs) Yeah, from an NDSU fan, man, I'm keeping it unbiased. I love it. Hey, going into the JMU category here a little bit, James Madison, we had two questions from Rob Jones and Hall Jones. Uh, I don't know if you guys are related. I don't believe so. But uh, Rob, I met met both of you, I think, down in Frisco. I was going to say, I feel like we met both these guys last year. We went out to the JMU <laughs> bars for the pre-party. They, I remember uh, I said to Kyle and you guys, you're like, you're going to the Bison bars? I was like, I always go to the Bison bars. Let's go party with James Madison fans. So um, what will challenge? who will challenge JMU in the regular season games this year? How and why? That's what Rob wants to know. And even if JMU goes 8-0, no, do you think we will really be able to judge how good they are given their relatively weak schedule, says Hall? So – I am saying no, man. And this is going to sound like just an NDSU fan who wants to avoid them. But seriously, I see the graduation rates and what they lost super comparable from 2017 to 2018. And the way this year, 2019 or 2020, going into 2021 spring season, the quarterback turnover, tons of graduations, 
Losing those stud defensive ends, stud linebacker. I mean, they bring back a lot of talent. Their recruiting has been great. But they are not going to be challenged at all. Like, let's not cupcake it. This podcast has thrown Kennesaw and Jacksonville State and every other team that's not remotely close to the big three, as we call them, under the bus for week schedules. And just because JMU's JMU, if NDSU was on the schedule, I'd say the same damn thing. There is no way we can just judge them until the playoffs. Elon, who we thought who they're going to play twice, who we thought could be the ranked team that could compete with them, barely won this week against a non-scholarship. Oh, and they lost their starting quarterback. So what's going to happen? JMU is going to throttle them. They're going to throttle Robert Morris. I'm seeing betting lines come out, and it's like NDSU by 16 and Eastern by 7. And James Madison, minus 45. So they, they're going to play the weakest schedule I think I've ever seen for someone in the CAA. Not their fault. Play what you can control. But I truly believe I can't judge James Madison until what happens in those playoff matchups. Maybe not even until the quarters if they play some auto bid that, you know, is just there because they auto bidded. So I see nobody challenging James Madison. I don't see them losing a single game in the regular season. But I don't know what they are. And if they win the national title, that's awesome because then they get to show me exactly what. Yeah, I don't know. My answer is I don't know, but my hunch is they are not as going to be as elite as we saw of 2017, 2019, but they could still win a national title. So because everybody else also seems to be a little bit of a lower tier. Chris, what do you think? Am, am I just throwing out crap at JMU or am I kind no, of on the right track here? You're on the right track. You, we're not going to learn anything. Uh, they, they, Like you said, Elon is probably their best um, competition and they did not look good week one. Once again, week one, pump the brakes for all we know. Just really bad, but we brought up it's never good when you lose quarterback. Um, I just, I'm afraid. I think they are a, a good. T- some people are too hard on them, and some people are too quick to see them fall, which is a weird line to flirt to, like, kind of bring back reality to both sides. JMU is still a good team, and I think in another year they could make a deep playoff run, but I think they are just going to be so untested going into the playoffs. That depending on who that first matchup is, if it's anybody remotely decent, they could be in real trouble because they haven't had anybody that even lines up remotely square to them all year. So I think James Madison might have an early exit from the playoffs, but still be probably one of the top five teams. I just think they're going to come in so untested that if they get punched in the face early and fall behind, I'm not sure they're going to know how to climb out of that hole this spring. That's what I'm afraid of. You're making the argument for teams that commonly play weak schedules. Um, And let me give JMU the NDSU treatment here a little bit, which is let's not twist it in terms of great offensive line. I know they returned, I think, three starters there. The running backs are beasts. Great running back play. They brought in some more studs that are going to be on the outside for the wideouts. Um, And the defense looks good, like it always does, as JMU has really established a strong defensive presence. Obviously, you're not going to doubt the coaching. you got a good staff there with James Madison. So across the board, JMU looks good. Not sure about a non-scholarship, um, but could I have seen James Madison beating Youngstown 32 to three? Sure. Could I see them of uh, beating you and I uh, 27 to 17? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's just unknown right now. And I will keep going back to it. Which quarterback steps up, which QB steps up during the FCS spring season? Um, that's going to be the question. Cole Johnson, Trey Lance, true freshman SDSU. You got, um, Eric Berrier, oh, why? I'm not going to question EB3, uh, except when he plays. No, we're not going to get into that right now, Chris. We're going to hold off. We're going to hold <laughs> off on that for you, man. Um, all right, let's move into our final two main uh, section topics, and we're going to get into some quick hitters, man. Uh, Jacob Martinez, awesome page fan. Lots of upsets this week, he says. Which underdogs looked genuinely impressive and which were maybe just facing an overrated team or both? He's thinking of South Dakota State, North Dakota, Tarleton, Tennessee Tech, and sort of ETSU. So I'll just eliminate SDSU, you and I right there. I still think you and I is a pretty good team. So I think they could be a top 12 squad, obviously. And so I don't think they were, that game came down to the wire. So I don't think you're looking at much of an upset when it was, you know, five versus two or wherever here or Athlon and all those guys had them. And uh, North Dakota and Tennessee Tech were pretty big shockers to me because I was sold that Southern Illinois would be even better from last year. So kudos to UND and Tennessee Tech, man, Austin P they, they took that to them. And, uh, that, you know, the final score uh, maybe wasn't indicative of how much of a kind of a beatdown it was. So 
credit to Tennessee Tech, man, the Golden Eagles, and they're going to get a big test here coming up against J uh, Jacksonville State this weekend. That's going to be a fun OBC matchup. So, Chris, which of those upsets, man, really kind of threw you for a loop? Which one kind of shocked you a little bit, and were they actual upsets? Obviously, the Tarleton, New Mexico State. Um, but, like I said, I think that's more New Mexico State, which is weird to say being overrated, just because I have the FBS tag attached to them. Um, but, I mean, other than that, obviously, North Dakota is the one that everybody's talking about. Look how many questions we had about it. And I will admit, I was taken back by that last week when I was actually doing my betting. Um, I ended up picking every single spread I could find on my bookie. And that was one of the two games I avoided completely. I even bet North Dakota State wouldn't cover the spread against Youngstown and got that correct. I was more confident on Youngstown being able to hold North Dakota State than I was Southern Illinois being able to cover, I think it was only like four and a half against um, Southern Illinois or against North Dakota. So North Dakota, it, it, struck me as one of those games where I'm like, you know, this is the game I could see this actually happening in. I'm just all hands off avoiding it. Nice. Yeah, North Dakota, man, credit to them. That that was a heck of a win. So I think that was kind of the big shocker there. And we'll see how it goes moving forward. And good job to those Golden Eagles. Once again, we're going to get to see. This is what's really cool about both those. I just kind of thought of this. Uh, Tennessee Tech, welcome to Jacksonville State. Uh, UND, welcome to Plains, South Dakota State. So now we get to see you guys had the shockers in the beginning, and now we'll see what you're made of. And I would love to see some more upsets. It just makes things more fun, uh, makes things more chaotic. So I'm here for the chaos. Uh, final main one, man, Jamie Williams, it throws us another one. More overrated team from the fall, Southern Illinois or Austin P. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, I think Southern Illinois is less overrated because I think they just ran into kind of this, um, hyped up UND buzzsaw where UND is like, we're here. It's our first Valley team. These guys are ranked 24. They think we're not even worthy of top 25. And they've built that program to start being what they want them to be as a tough top Grand Forks, North Dakota team. So I honestly think that the Southern Illinois um, was more of an upset because yeah, I think Southern Illinois was more, more of an upset than the Austin P game. What do you think, Chris? Yeah. I'm with you. I think I think Southern Illinois is definitely more of an upset than Austin P. Um, speaking of Tennessee Tech is now getting top 25 votes, and I mean I guess North Dakota is too. But Austin P was 0 and 4 coming into the year. I know a lot of that was against the FBS opponents, but and you look at it now, they they don't have a win. And I think when you look at that, Southern Illinois was getting top 10 votes. Where Austin P, I guess some people probably were. Most people had them outside the top 10. So speaking of it, it appears that Tennessee Tech and North Dakota are getting viewed as very similar teams. Um, I'm going to say the win over Southern Illinois was more impressive than Austin P. Southern Illinois was sitting between that like 10 to 15 mark and Austin P was sitting between that 15 to 20. Yeah, I think people thought Austin P was a team that made a good run last year, ended in Montana State. And like, yeah, they're still top 25 to start the year, but we could see them taking a step back. And I think with Southern Illinois, people thought it would be ascending. I think it was like, ooh, they just missed the playoffs. They got a good roster coming back. The quarterback's back. They're ascending upward. So maybe that's just off-season narrative. So that's why I think I view it as more of a, ooh, Southern Illinois got beat, where, oh, yeah, I could have seen Austin P dropping because what are the odds they go back to the quarters this year? Um, so, But kudos to them on a good season last year. So, all right, my man, Chris, let's get into some of the uh, random quick hit questions. Uh, most of these actually are still FCS related, but we've got some fun ones in here too. Uh, Adam Peterson wants to know, did Missouri State really postpone their game against Illinois State because of weather? Or is it just because they didn't want to get the brakes beat off them? No, nope, Missouri State got their soccer field cleaned up nicely. What's the reason they couldn't do that to their football field? If you guys are watching this on YouTube, I'm showing clips of what that field looked like on like what would have been game day. Um, I don't understand this at all. There, I, I have no intel on this. I have no special sources. Uh, Hero Sports, Tweet Sam Herder, somebody more important than me. I have no idea why this game was not played. Uh, the soccer field seemed to do okay. I guess maybe it was precautionary because of the events that unfolded in weeks prior here with Texas and the winter storms and power outages. Maybe it was just like a better safe than sorry situation. That's going to be my assumption because on game day, it sure looks like you could have had some two football fields squaring off there. Did you get a chance to look at those photos, Chris? Yeah, you know, once again, it, I just thought it was Montana, the only place that has bad weather during the spring. Um, I, I guess it's nice to know that there are other schools out there that have bad weather during the spring. But 
looked to me like they were able to clear some fields. So I don't know why that game wasn't played. I agree with you. It was probably cautionary, but eh, seems like a cop out answer to me. Yeah, I, I don't think they would have wanted to get there. <laughs> I don't think they're worried about losing as much. I'm sure there was some sort of precautionary step taken. So Scott Moffin wants to know, is Tarleton's easy win proof that New Mexico State should move to the FCS? Now, correct me on this, Chris. What is uh? What do you think? Where's New Mexico State going to go down at the FCS level? People, we just need to put this to bed. They are never going down to the FCS. One, uh, coming from the, the guy who represents the team that has moved down to the FCS, right? Yep. Um, Idaho had a rich history in the Big Sky, founding member of the Big Sky with the University of Montana after both were kicked out of what became the Pac-12 and the Pacific Coast Conference. We had a history here. New Mexico State, as we touched on, has four bowl game appearances in their lifetime and has yet put in perspective, Idaho was in the FBS for three years or 20 years and had three bowl appearances, three wins. New Mexico state had been in forever since the FBS was a thing and have four. They're terrible, but they have no desire to go down because one, they don't have a rich history in the FCS Two, They are a basketball school. And for them, their rivalry with New Mexico and the rivalry with UTEP goes on beyond more than just sports. It goes into recruiting the El Paso and um, Albuquerque area. And for them, there isn't those other options. There isn't a buttload of FCS schools like there is in the West. People just aren't familiar with it. Uh, there's only one FCS school in Arizona. You know, like that would mean they would just be viewed on a different level than their two major rivals, not just in sports, in admissions, in getting students to go to their schools. And that is the main reason they will not go to the FCS is they have to be on a level marketing playing field with UTEP and New Mexico, whether their program absolutely sucks or not. Trust me. I have, I would love to play the red Aggies again. We have a weird quasi star cross lovers relationship with the red Aggies in New Mexico <laughs> state two time Sunbelt members. We are and founder or members of the WAC who's back. Apparently like I would love for them to come to the FCS, join the big sky or stay in the WAC, but get to play those guys again. It's just, it's never going to happen. Should it happen is a different story. Yes. Would we like to have them? Yes. Will it ever happen? A third condo on the line, condo in Hawaii. It will not happen. I'm going to run out of condos, but I'm safe. All of them are going to be safe. It's easy to afford this many condos, though, when the revenue rolls in from all these podcasts. I mean, it's just what? ding, ding, ding. Why do you, you think get... I'm working six podcasts, man? It's two podcasts per condo. <laughs> you know the famous quote that's not true. You get into radio for the money, 100%. Exactly. Yeah, so. and because you have a beautiful face. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. I threw this on. I'm, we haven't got that shade thrown on us yet. We should. Oh, you guys went on YouTube and you really showed us why you should be on radio. <laughs> <laughs> this should be a strictly audio format. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. So, um, hey, so looking at Joshua Hoffman, this is a fun one, man. As you know, we answer every question when we ask for questions on our page. He wants to know if the if every FCS team is. Um, a corporation that is considered like a stock on the stock market. Who mm -hmm. should I buy and who should I sell? That you finally found a broker on Wall Street that you can trust and who can consistently make you money. Sound fair enough? Um, so it's interesting. Do you want to take this from like a long-term perspective, Chris? Or do you want to day trade this for the spring season? What, what do you want to do here? Your GameStop is 100% Tarleton State. Mm. Your, your long term, you're consistent. Your Berkshire Hathaway, you know, A shares, that's your North Dakota state right there. Like if, if you're looking for that balance between there, who's the next Netflix, who's the next Amazon? I mean, Matt touched on it. You, you're looking at somebody like probably a North Dakota. I don't want to toot our own horn here, but Idaho does have a rich history in the FCS. Um, so maybe look at a company like Levi Strauss, who went private after being public for a while, came back on, has done decent in the stock market as a return. Um, if we're going to make make NCAA FCS schools stocks, those are kind of my you know, off the top of my head. I did not see this question, but absolutely loved it. Nice job, Joshua Hoffman. Um, those are kind of my takes. You know, you got Idaho, Levi Strauss, you got Berkshire Hathaway Air, uh, A stock shares. That's your North Dakota State and GameStop, baby, Tarleton. They rocketed up to the moon. Let's see if they can even beat Dixie because I'll put my money down right now. I think Dixie beats them. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, going out with the predictions already. We'll get some more of those at the end of the episode. 
Uh, yeah, That's I weeks think in um, <laughs> Albany, and it's not Dogcoin. My awesome coworker told me this is not Dogcoin. Dogecoin. Doge. Albany is Dogecoin to me. They have a great quarterback right now who is a great, it's a great story. Under Cuffler, which is one of the coolest names ever. But it's something everybody's going to talk about. And maybe it gets a little bit of hype, a little bit of this or that. But eventually it's going to flatten out and be and go away. So not to just like downplay the Great Danes. I have a Great Dane. Uh, but I just think Albany is like this cool story like Dogecoin. You randomly see that trends, but now it's going to actually turn into anything. I think North Carolina A&T is my hidden tech stock right now. I think now that they're moving in and they're going to be competing in the playoffs, I think that's going to give them more ammo for more recruiting. They already have a good base. They put NFL talent into the NFL. So North Carolina, NC A&T, the Aggies, is going to be my, oh, right now, I don't think that's ever going to be a thing. And then, bam, it's going to make its way up. Ignore the past. Ignore all that stuff. They're coming. They're, that's going to be a good team. If everybody wants to help Chris afford more condos after I probably lose all three, knowing my luck in this, uh, to turn the question back on itself, would love if everybody went out and bought some Dogecoin. Uh, big owner, or sorry, everybody went out and bought some Albany. Big owner in Albany. Ah, uh, big Albany. Guy. And big I did, Albany owner. A lot yeah. of great dang going. <laughs> <laughs> I bought Dogecoin when it was less than a penny for like 3,500 shares. And then it got up to like four cents and I made like 200 bucks or something. I don't know what it was, but I, I dumped it because it was through the Robin hood app. I could not stand with Robin hood anymore. So I died on my morals. Uh, Speaking I probably could be funny interview. I know not everybody loves barstool. Dave Portnoy's interview with Vlad, the CEO is yes. if, if whether you, if, as, if you're interested in trading economics, uh, barstool, him just taking this corporate young tech CEO and just being like, what you're saying is just total faceless, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like watching his reaction. I'm like, I'm not on CNBC where they let me get away with this stuff. This dude is showing videos of me with a clown nose on. I was like, thank you. As a Robin hood user, uh, Albany coin holder. Um, you know. <laughs> Flawless man. You, the, the Albany coin. I love it. Hey, and great Danes. <laughs> Just like all these other people, prove me wrong, and I'll admit it on the show. My hero for a radio host, I love him. People give him hate. I love Colin Coward, so I'll do where Matt was wrong, where Matt was right. I'm totally cool with that. So, all right, man, last two here. We have Jesse Lacrosse. He's an NDSU fan. Uh, takeaway from last week is that games are 100 times better without marching bands. Uh, Jesse, I'll just say this for Kyler, who's not here. Kyler would probably agree with you. He always gives hate under the marching bands. Um, That's because Eastern can't afford marching a marching band. band. Yeah, the Gold Star and Marching Band not lining up in front of the Bison helmet for the players to run through, for them not being in the stands, playing the music. I mean, let's just be, I wish the Gold Star Marching Band from an NDSU standpoint is out there. I think games are better with the bands. It's part of the environment. So, no, Jesse, I'm sorry. I got to disagree with you. I defend the bands, and I think they should be out there. I'm totally cool if schools take it for a safety protocol, and the bands are supportive of that thing. But I would side with the bands if they wanted to play and they're being told no. I don't know how that's really that much different from the football players who are sticking around next to each other. Probably more yeah. spit. Probably more spit. I was going to say, the difference is you're you're blowing an airborne virus yeah. like actively through the air where football players are just breathing. Uh, yep. But I'm with you, man. College football is, is special because of the pageantry. And part of the pageantry is weird chants, bands, and you running out of the tunnel, fight songs, alma mater. like. I mean, college football is not the same without the bands. Just like sports haven't been the same without the fans. Uh, absolutely, Jesse Lacrosse. That is a terrible question. You are banned from having questions read on this podcast for six days. Uh, six days, Jesse. Sorry, you're gonna have to miss next week, man. Uh, Adam Willie, just barely, <laughs> just barely. Adam wants to know final question of the fun stuff, and then we're gonna roll into uh, betting lines if you'd like to, Chris. And then we'll roll into games of the week. Um, oh yeah. What should I? Why should I move to your state? and why i believe adam is from illinois um adam you're an ndsu fan there's not much more i have to say besides coming up here to north dakota uh, also if we break off into our own state uh, we have some of the best military weapons up here we have a lot of oil we have agriculture so we could self-sustain geographical center of north america i mean we got all the things that a country needs so if anything ever breaks off north dakota is the place to be we're like that place that's unattractive but you kind of were like the bunker. Why would you ever need a bunker? Like, why would you need North Dakota? And then when crap hits the fan, you're like, oh, I wish I was there. So North Dakota, man, self-sustaining. Chris, why, what about Idaho, man? Why you I feel like Adam, Adam Willie's 
uh, he's that guy at a bar who just like kind of kind of keeps working around the question he's trying to ask you. Last week it was, "Hey Chris, Montana or Idaho?" This week it's like, "Hey, each host, why should I pick your state?" Obviously, Adam wants out of Illinois and wants to come to Idaho. He's just waiting for me just to sell him on it, apparently. Apparently, public and private land talks were not enough for him last week. So, Adam, I will just tell you right now, Boise, Idaho right now is the fastest growing city in the country. So if you're looking for growth, it's there. Now, me, I live here, just moved back in September. It's not really my speed. I'd recommend there's beautiful places like Coeur d'Alene you can move to. McCall, if you like the ritziness, we basically have the original Aspen in the Sun Valley. But the most important thing, and I guess you just didn't get, get it last year, uh, our last week is you had the Frank church wilderness, Frank church river of no return wilderness, the largest protected wilderness in the lower continental United States. It is no motorized vehicles. The only way in it is raft power boat and horseback. Ooh. And it is millions, millions of acres. It unexplored wilderness, no motorized vehicles. It's why it's called the river of no return. It's the snake river. Uh, it's world-class white class rapids. So if you're trying to get outside and be away from people, man, with, and feel like Lewis and Clark, that is what it is. That's the Oregon trail It's the river of no return through Idaho and the Frank church wilderness. Not to mention you have the beautiful Hills of the Palouse. You have the Bitterroot mountain range. You have the sawtooth mountain range. You actually have part of Yellowstone. Um, you have Boise. If you're looking for a tech job and you know a growing market where you can grow up some equity in a house, you've got it. It's, it's just a state with tons of beauty, everything from high, high arid desert to mountainous ranges to the rolling wheat plains of the Palouse, baby. Um, not much more you, you could ask for other than 32 ounces of beer for $2.50. At the Chris is... Chris, at what point are you going to be part of the podcast for tourism in Idaho? Because that was phenomenal. I that need to awesome. reach out to the the tourism board and be like, you need to sponsor FCS Fans Nation, Big Sky yeah. Podcast Networks, and Tubs at the Club, man. We're just selling Idaho week to week. We just got the Big Sky Podcast Network, just got a sponsor, Hughes River Expeditions, which their whole ad read is going down through the river of no return. Like awesome. They need to pay me something, man. I've got a, a, three, three podcasts in a week. I just hit them with tourism crap. Start the fourth condo on the way, Adam Willie. Should I be putting it in Illinois? Nice, man. Well done. Good for you guys. And check out all those podcasts Chris just mentioned. Uh, Big Sky Podcast Network is a great one to be a part of for sure. All right, man. This kind of brings us to the end of all our questions and stuff. We're going to hit our game of the week. But do you have some betting lines? Maybe some people might be interested Ooh. for the FCS coming up this week. I do. I do. I've got I've got five lines. I think that everybody I feel like are safe bets and everybody should take on. And I got one really frisky parlay for everybody. Uh, Youngstown State 5.5 and the under uh, against Northern Iowa. I think Northern Iowa a little rattled. I think Youngstown showed enough to me against um, North Dakota State that they're going to look good. But both offenses look bad. I know 39 as an under is low. But both those offenses just did not look good. If you don't like Youngstown plus five at five and a half, then just take the under on this one. I don't think both these teams are hitting 20. Um, another one, James Madison, 38.5. Robert Morris is like marginally better than Moorhead State, and they just won, hung 52 to 53 on them. Uh, I don't see why they can't hang at least 39 on Ro Robert Morris. Uh, you're looking at Jackson State. I know you can't judge much off them just playing a D2 or lower school last week, but Neon Dion and the boys are playing arguably, the worst, sadly, the worst FCS program historically, being Jerry Rice's alma mater, Mississippi Valley State. Um, Jackson State and Neon Dion only favored by 11, and that seems like easy, easy, easy money. And next... Next up, baby, NAU. You got Keandre Wooti, the transfer from Oklahoma State, going up against who's projected to be the worst team in the Big Sky. Um, and if you just don't believe, you're like, well, Case Cook is, is gone at NAU. They still have the best returning duo of wide receivers and Brandon Porter and Hendricks Johnson in the Big Sky. It does not matter who's throwing them the ball. They will beat Southern Utah by, by at least a touchdown, and that's all you need for them to win. If you don't think NS NAU is better than SSU by or SUU by a touchdown, then avoid it. But I'm highly confident this could be by 21 points. And then last but not least, Weber. Uh, I'm going to say take the over, actually, against Weber State and Idaho State. I know what you're thinking. Weber State's really good at defense, and Idaho State is bad. I think Randall Johnson, or Cunningham, or Johnson is the 
new transfer quarterback from Mid Tennessee State going to Weaver is actually really good. You have guys like Rashid Shahid and Josh Davis back there to support him if he's not. Uh, I think Weber State could easily win this one by putting up 50. And I think Idaho State is not going to be quite as bad as people think. They'll probably be able to put 10 points on the board. If you're feeling frisky, my frisky parlay. This is, do not keep me on a record on this one. This is like, you want a lot of money and you want something to make you feel a little bit of excitement in your life. Jacksonville State minus 12 against Tennessee Tech. Tennessee Tech maybe riding a little high against the governors who we mentioned on haven't won yet. So maybe a little bit too high there, a little too much credit to Tennessee Tech. And you pair that one with Idaho plus 5.5. So underdogs, you expect them to lose by five or less to Eastern Washington and the under at 62.5. I think Southern, uh, Eastern Washington's defense has improved and Idaho has a very underrated defense. I actually don't see them hitting the 62.5 mark in this game on Saturday. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for those betting lines. There you go, guys. Chris Hammond, Tubbs at the club just made you some sweet cash. Get that Hopefully. money. If your state allows it, you got a website you use. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what Chris brings you guys. So uh, finale here, we're going to do game of the week, and then we're going to roll out for this week, guys, and we'll catch you next week. Um, we are we were going to do, obviously, the State Fair Classic, but that was rescheduled till March 13th. That is a classic game between Prairie View and Grambling. That was going to be dead set game of the week. Uh, Cotton Bowl has some issues with it right now, so they're moving that to March 13th. We'll catch it on the back end. Um, I'll go with the two since we were supposed to have some other folks here with us tonight, Chris. I'll make some predictions for two of them, and I'm going to leave you for Idaho and Eastern Washington, which I'm sure you're a little passionate about. Um, Tennessee Tech versus Jacksonville State. I think Jacksonville State has played really well. They have an FBS win. I think they're going to come in, and I think they're going to have an OBC-style um, dominance that they had before. I think that they should be picked to win the OBC and I think they're going to be Tennessee Tech pretty handily. I'm actually going to go 34 to 13. I think despite what Tennessee Tech did to Austin P, doesn't mean a lot to me. I'm going to take Jacksonville State. I did almost nail South Dakota State for the game of the week last week, so I'm proud on that. And the second one we were going to do was South Dakota State UND. Sorry, UND. I love what you did. Um, but I really, really like that freshman quarterback from South Dakota State. He seemed to stretch the field a little bit. Mark Gronowski, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. SDSU fans will kill me if not. 31-17, uh, South Dakota State beats UND. So I'm going with no upsets there. I'm going with the bigger dogs. And Chris, the floor is your, my, yours, my man. Eastern Washington versus Idaho. You have no uh, eagle power hour to push back on you for this. What do you think of that for our third game of the week, man? Yeah, so I'm weighing, you know, I'm going to give you guys the 60 second rundown on how this how this game could play out, right? Last year, going into halftime, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, Idaho actually beat number 12 Eastern Washington, or number 11 Eastern Washington last year. They're currently ranked number 12 this year, also returning to the Kibbe Dome, where the demolish of them happened last year. Now, the problem with that game, Eric Berry, a Walter Payton final, or, you know, favorite going into this year only had 20 yards going into halftime going into the fourth quarter 12 minutes left that game was a 28 to 7 game idaho was absolutely manhandling the eagles of eastern washington now here's what changed aaron best decided that it was a great idea to try to run the ball on idaho and like i said has probably one of if not the best front seven in the entire fcs and it was not going anywhere the instant they let Eric Berrier start trying to air it out, they were able to put 20 unanswered points in the fourth quarter uh, to almost come back and win that game last year. On the flip side, according to the two deeps released by the Spokesman Review, the paper that covers Eastern Washington, and I understand that things fluctuate as the game goes on, but it appears their base defensive scheme is going to be a 4-2-5, including a linebacker that is six foot. 205 pounds, an Idaho transfer, and Ty Graham, who now plays for the East Washington Eagles. Idaho has a 6'1", 240-pound running back named Roshan Johnson that I think is going to be meeting him in the gap a lot, and that is going to be a constant five, six, seven yards of carry type thing unless they switch that up to a more traditional 4'3", or 3'4". The trick is, does Aaron Best learn from his mistakes last year and air the ball out because Idaho's strength is their front seven. Don't be running you into the teeth of the monster. Go over the monster, build a bridge, throw the ball, let your Walton Payton finalists air it out, and you've got guys like Tolo Limo Johnson and Andre Boston to be able uh, to, to, to make these plays, right? Now, for Idaho, you've got a brand-new quarterback, Mike Beaudry, Western uh, Florida transfer, took them to a D2 national title game. 
big, 6'5", 250 pounds, surprisingly athletic, still not quick, a lot like Cam Newton. He's not going to beat you with wheels, but his balls and size will win him in the run game where he'll hit you and fall for two. Um, now, does Paul Petrino get too cocky and air the ball out when you have the obvious the defense is giving you the run game, you have a really good like three-back system instead of backs that you're able to punish these Eastern Washington Eagles with. If these coaches do the optimal sets they can do, Eastern Washington should win this game. However, I am convinced for whatever reason, Aaron Best and Paul Petrino won't do either of those things. It's an absolute crapshoot, and because of that, I have to pick my Vandals. But I will say by four, um, and probably, no, I'll say three in overtime. I will go a three-point win. Let's go 24-21 in overtime. Yeah, overtime game. Give me that. That would be awesome. Well, hopefully we'll see what, excuse me, we will see all those things kind of play out for all these teams. Um, and we will see if Eastern Washington and Idaho is a classic as Chris is predicting. So we'll make sure to admit whether we were right or wrong, as we were all correct on our pick for South Dakota State last week, defeating you and I in a pretty close matchup. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. This has been the FCS Fans Nation podcast. If you are looking anywhere on the internet for somewhere where you do not have to be personally attacked and thrown shade at all the time, and you just have a community feel about something you care about and you're a fan of an FCS football team, we're where it's at. Search FCS Football Fans Nation uh, and you'll find us on all these platforms. We'll have pick them challenges. We'll have playoff challenges coming up. Lots of stuff happening for our group. Chris, thank you so much for joining me this evening. So we were able to hold down the fort. Hopefully we'll get Kyler and D-Law back here next week. But for now, we are repping our Sam Herder hates my team. NAU is here and the entire FCS is ready for week two. Hopefully we get a little bit more chaos and we'll break it all down now next week. Thanks for joining us, guys. Have a good evening. Stay safe out there. Cheers. Boom. Boom. Oh.